uh, welcome everyone uh, to our little webinar uh, on the metaverse um, that uh, our friends uh, of, from Digitopia and us TRDG uh, are doing. Um, today, we basically want to talk big picture about the metaverse and what really is uh, the, 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 brand, the opportunity for, for brands to, to seize the, the metaverse opportunity. Is it actually an opportunity? Um, all those different questions we want to uh, tackle. Uh, we essentially have uh, three parts. Um, I'm going to kick it off um, with uh, some sort of metaverse, metaverse version uh, that we developed at uh, TRGG. Uh, then Batuan uh, will take over uh, and talk a little bit about timing. Um, uh, why could it work right now? Um, so that's very interesting. And then last but not least, uh, Halil will take over and talk a little bit about, about an index of how can you actually measure uh, whether your organization is, uh, is, is essentially ready for the metaverse. Um, at the same time, we, we don't want to have it uh, as a one-way uh, presentation. Uh, a couple of you already sent some questions up front, uh, but also feel free to, to uh, put some questions in the chat uh, while we are talking. Um, and in the end, we want to have a discussion with you. Um, I think it's still such an early topic um, that nobody can claim sort of the final expertise over it. So we would be more than happy to to hear about um, your thoughts and maybe what your organization uh, is already doing uh, in that space. Um, so yeah, I would say, Halil, if you have a few words, um, I give it to you. Otherwise, uh, happy happy to start. Uh, just a welcome. Uh, thank you. My colleague Patuan and I will uh, represent Digitopia and talk about um, complementary to what Leo will uh, do as a great introduction. Um, this will be, uh, as Leo said, uh, rather short presentations, and we're looking forward to, uh, for a lively discussion at the end of this webinar. So please um, share your thoughts in the in the chat or your questions. And thank you all who has uh, who have completed the survey up front. And Leo, back to you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me check if my screen sharing works. You never know. Technology. It does. Um, you see my screen, right, Halil? Just give me a quick, perfect. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Good luck. All right. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, the next wave. Um, today, I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about our thoughts about the metaverse. And as you all know, these terms are um, uh, very much uh, like open and vague terms uh, sprinkled in uh, concepts such as VR, AR, Web3, NFTs, DAOs. It's really a bunch of different things, uh, and I think there's no one clear-cut definition of it. Um, in general, I want to talk about sort of why I really believe um, the metaverse uh, is sort of a next wave and a next platform where we will see a lot of uh, innovation happening. Um, and this is really sort of a big picture, 20-minute flyover. Um, we have only time to scratch the surface today, but we are always very happy to talk in depth about all the all of these topics, talk about strategy, talk about maybe how can a product look like in the space, what could a what could a venture be in the space that you want to start. So this is really the 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 big picture from thirty thousand feet uh, looking at the space. Um, I want to start with basically just saying, of course, there's so much noise, uh, and I think you hear a lot in the in the in the in the media either sort of the, the way of saying the metaverse is everything, it will change everything, it will change every industry, or it's just a, a huge fad and just like a big bubble that's currently bursting already. Uh, and I find it quite interesting that you see basically the same media outlets uh, on the one hand really celebrating the space and saying, hey, uh, there's great innovation happening, there's great, uh, there's great potential for businesses, for entrepreneurs. And at the same time, as you see here, uh, Basically, uh, it's like a big, it's a big bubble. Um, there's lots of articles these days about uh, the interest in uh, NFTs and the metaverse is, is falling fast. And the, the, the prices of NFTs, for example, have crashed. Um, currently, the, the Facebook or Meta stock is, is on a continuous decline because investors don't really believe in, uh, in, in their activities in, in sort of VR and AR. Um, so there's on the one hand this really bad press about oh this is a this is a big bubble and then at the same time uh, the same news outlets say in the, two weeks later oh this is going to change everything so I think always when there's um, there's so much polarization happening um, it's it's difficult to sort of say okay what is really trend and what is real uh, and that's why I want to basically start with sort of a, a a big a big picture assessment of why I think this this trend of the metaverse is actually interesting to follow over the next couple of years. 
Uh, and the, re the, the way I think about this is, is very broad from sort of almost like an economic point of view. And I uh, studied economics. I very, very much think like an economist. Um, so this is basically the economic assessment of why I think this space is interesting. And I think of it as you can think of it as like progress in the physical world versus the digital world. Uh, and if we look at over the last, let's say, like 150 years, we have seen a lot of progress in the physical world. Just the, the average life standard has been seeing an in, incredible progress uh, over this time period. Uh, we basically uh, all got our first TV over the last 150 years. We all basically got our own toilets, our own washing machines. It was the first time we were able to fly. Uh, so there's been lots of, of, of progress happening uh, in this period, but then actually what we see since the 1970s, this, this progress is actually declining. Uh, and there's this sort of famous quote by Peter Thiel who says, uh, if you take away computer science and if you maybe take away the iPhone, the world actually didn't change that much over the past 50 years. Um, so I think what we see in the physical world is that the average experience of a human being is actually only changing very marginally um, uh, from, uh, from one year to another. If we, at the other hand, look at, at the digital world and what's been happening maybe since the, the mid of the last century is actually just is in changing at an ever faster pace. Um, so maybe in the beginning, it was quite slow. We thought of computers being only useful for some sort of uh, mathematical, um, uh, some sort of problem solving uh, in, in big companies. We thought of them as sort of computational machines um, most of the times. But then over the past sort of 20 years, we have seen this sort of acceleration where digital technologies have essentially taken over every aspect of our lives, whether it's traveling, whether it's finance, whether it's gaming, whether it's entertainment, digital technologies basically have been capable to, to take over all of these different industries. Um, and what they essentially enable is that they provide a great customer experience at zero marginal cost. So like one digital experience, you can just scale across millions, if not billions of people. And my whole argument, I think, here is if you take these two things together, the progress that we see in the digital world, whether it's the progress that we see in the physical world, at some point there will be like an overlap where we actually say, hey, spending time in the digital world is, is more interesting than being in the physical world because we just have this infinite or sheer infinite space of optimization in the digital world, whether it's the physical world. And I think we, we are basically almost at this point. And in some areas, we maybe have progress uh, uh, crossed it already, where we say, hey, me as an individual, I actually prefer to spend time uh, in the digital world versus the, the, the physical world. And, and that's what I'm trying to say here. Like, yeah, in some, some areas, let's talk about work. Uh, we are in a, in a digital webinar. We kind of choose the digital space right now over the physical space. Um, so my, 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 my big picture argument is let's, let's look at how people spend their time. Um, We've all seen since COVID this huge push towards remote work, like all employees, or not all employees, but so many uh, employees in the, in the knowledge economy basically say, hey, I kind of prefer to work remotely because digital technologies allow me to do so. Um, let's look at TikTok. If you have, I don't know, kids who are between, let's say, 12 and 17, how much time do they spend on TikTok? They actually prefer to socialize in a digital space versus um, versus maybe meeting in the people in the in the real world. And then last but not least, and I know that I'm like touching a very sensitive ethical question here, there's maybe something uh, what we could call a reality privilege. And that's a term called by, by Mark and Reason, who essentially says digital experiences or digital technologies, they enable us to, to basically provide a better customer slash life experience for many millions of people at scale and they will choose the digital space over the physical space. Um, um, <clears throat> so the, the, the bottom line is essentially more and more people spend time in the digital space because it's, it's in the end faster, it's cheaper and it's better. And I'm very much aware that this is sort of ethically a big problem and uh, I'm, I'm now ethics uh, expert, uh, expert, that's why I don't really uh, touch upon it more here, but sort of from a pure economist point of view, people will make choices and I believe the fact that digital technologies have this inherent capability of being so scalable and, and improving over time, um, people will continue to spend more time in some sort of uh, digital, digital world. 
So that leaves me with a big picture question also that I would ask as maybe like a brand or any big, big corporate, where do, where do people spend their time in maybe five, 10 years? Like I, I would think about that question maybe even like philosophically to, in order to answer uh, like way down like a strategic question of what do I want to do in the next sort of two, three, four, five years? Um, but then maybe now let's talk about um, what is it? What is the, the metaverse? And here again, I would be very much like a skeptic and would argue there's actually no such thing as the as a as a metaverse. And I think it, about it more as sort of the the internet as we know it. And there's just this continuous improvement and uh, S curve development over time. You see on the left side, it's sort of these famous slides by Benedict Evans, who who argues there's this S curve framework of you find a new infrastructure technology that's being created, and then over time it's being deployed. Um, new companies built on that new infra uh, tech infrastructure. Uh, until there's sort of a new technology coming in. And I think right now what we essentially see is a whole bunch of technology, maybe it's AR, it's VR, it's crypto. They're being still created right now. They are not in the maturity phase. Um, they're being created, they will scale and they might become new platforms. And, and these platforms in the end, we will call the metaverse, a metaverse, potentially something completely different. So I don't really care about the jargon so much. I would just look at, how is the underlying technology evolving and, and why is that maybe relevant? Um, and I think if you today wanna, wanna think about the, the metaverse, um, one way for me to look at it, I think is, and I'm, I'm sure many of you read the, the, the article, is sort of this Matthew Ball uh, assessment. And, and right now we really think about the metaverse as being this, this mix of VR and AR where we have this real-time 3D rendered virtual world where people can come together, uh, socialize and try a bunch of different things. But in the end, that definition is a work in progress. It might change. It might be something completely else uh, in the future. And honestly, it doesn't really matter of matter so much how we how we think about um, and define the concept today. Um, the second aspect, uh, also also from stolen from Matthew Ball, um, I think in the end, there's like multiple of these technologies that that come together and they will create something uh, in the future. And it's sort of this: we will evolve into a next phase. Uh, of the internet. I think right now for a brand, potentially the most interesting aspect is essentially not the technology, but just looking at what do we see new in sort of content services and assets that are being created by this native uh, uh, native culture that's emerging, maybe in the crypto space, maybe in the gaming space. So I wouldn't, as a brand, not even look so much at the how is hardware improving, but just as what's the new culture. In the end, it's just more like also like a cultural uh, phenomenon. Um, so then the, the question for today is maybe what can brands do? And again, I think wrong question. I think what is the really question? What should brands not do? I think that's the, the, the first thing that I say to clients when they come to me with, with a question of like, hey, what's this new space? What can we do? And I basically give just an example is the worst thing you can do is just like a random NFT drop. And I think we have seen a lot of that over sort of the past, let's say, 12 to 18 months. I think that's super dangerous um, because random NFT basically just says, I basically chase a hype. Uh, I don't really care about uh, how we define the space. I basically throw in uh, crypto is the same as metaverse, is the same as AR, VR. I, it, 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 I've seen a lot, and Pepsi is basically an example of that, a, a lot of sort of random activity. And I think it's it's super dangerous if you just do that because if you don't have a strategy, these things will create adverse uh, effects down the road. Uh, and I think it's already happening for for the Pepsi NFT drop. Think about one of your customers uh, would buy your hypothetical NFT at a super high price last year in December, thinking, okay, this is the I don't know what it is, but everybody buys it. It seems to be the future. You spend in this case. 25,000 uh, real US dollars on it. Uh, and then suddenly people realize that maybe the space is too early, interest rates rise a bit, crypto is crashing. Suddenly that person that buys a product from your brand lost $24,000 and is trying to, to sell uh, that particular NFT um, for, for less than an ETH. Um, probably to do some tax loss harvesting, but in the end, it's just like a terrible experience. Like I've trusted maybe this brand because if big brands go into the space, it must be real. And then I lose money. That's that's really dangerous, I think. Um, so I think done wrong and 
if it's an NFT strategy or a metaverse strategy, I think there's there's so much risk. There's brand risk. You you just leave behind scorched earth. People lose real money. We have very often like questions where uh, a legal team uh, from from a corporate comes to us and say, hey, we actually need to figure out do we engage in I don't know in the crypto case money laundering etc. We don't know who's buying from us. There's so many things that you have to think through before you act, um, and I think taking time is 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 super crucial. Um, so when we then think about like what can brands do, I think for me it's it's three things, and they they may seem very obvious and and nothing special, but I think most people don't do them, and and that's really where where a good good strategy and a good um, yeah a good a, a good strategy and a good sort of next three to five years start. I think the first one is essentially experience. And I love this quote by by Benedict Evans, who basically says, uh, it's generally unwise to have a strong opinion about a fundamentally new experience that you haven't actually experienced. Um, and what I mean by that is I often see sort of corporate leaders or experts that sort of have a very strong opinion on the space, but they actually have never tried anything, any application. Um, so I, what I always say basically in the crypto context is half an ETH, which is currently probably around $750, like 0 0.5 ETH in action is much better than any webinar, including this one. It's it's take the money, take the risk, try maybe some applications in the space, and that will give, get you a long way and, and you will learn a lot uh, along the way that, that can you you can apply to, to your organization. Um, it doesn't have to only be, be crypto. I think you're still early in many, many different ways. Um, there's for sure on the left side, the, the crypto experience where you just sort of buy some coins on Coinbase, get your first MetaMask and just try maybe buying an NFT on, on OpenSea. That alone will teach you a lot. Maybe you go to, to, to Best Buy and try sort of the new VR experience from Meta and just sort of see, okay, how, it, how does it actually feel to be in one of these sort of new VR experience? I've, I've just sort of did one of those where I sort of worked in a, in, a, in a virtual office and I could see my screen being extended to sort of virtual worlds, which was pretty cool. And I, I didn't know about it. So just seeing that is is much more much more important than anything. And the last one is just just read and learn. Uh, I mean, there's now Substack, Twitter, podcast. I think just constantly being engaged with the matter is something that many people don't do. I think that's really key if you really want to try to figure out where the where the space is going. Um, the second one, and I mentioned that before already, is is strategy. Um, don't just do like a random sort of one-off thing where you where you after like six months like don't really know. What you what you want to do with it anymore? Really think about the space long term, and and this is just very a high level example of a framework that we have used in the past of how you can think about the space. Um, you can sort of divide it roughly, sort of in, into like a centralized and a decentralized space, and then you can you can come from different angles. Uh, if you're like into VR and AR experiences, you kind of know there's like lots of media attention on it, but there's not really mass scale adoption yet. We know that. Facebook or Meta is pouring lots of money into it, but it's still a very early space. At the same time, if you go sort of more into the e-gaming space, huge market, we see a lot of players there already. Maybe that's something where you want to, as a brand, sort of uh, uh, sort of pack yourself uh, onto and, and, and try some sort of collaboration or partnerships. And then maybe on the decentralized side, it could be a, a, an NFT. Like we don't say doing an NFT drop is, is the wrong thing, but think about it as sort of a a long-term play? How can maybe my NFT engage with a physical good? So I think having a framework and thinking these things through is is is, is actually absolutely cru crucial. Um, and then last but not least, I think we think about it as sort of pilots and bets, like think about as an organization, like how much of a risk appetite do you have in this space? Uh, and we, as an example, just took here uh, the different uh, the different approaches by, by Adidas and and, and and Nike, Adidas, I mean, it's it's still big numbers, but they essentially just sort of had this 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 first NFT drop, which which led them to a lot of sales. Uh, if you look on the other hand to like a, a Nike, they really take a strong like a strong opinion on the space already by doing a massive uh, acquisition of um, uh, of artifact. Uh, and we think of this this acquisition essentially could be like the Air Jordan um, like thirty years ago. Uh, back then, they basically bought the small brand. Uh, nobody really thought big about it. Revenues were quite small. But in the end, 30 years later, that's sort of a $5 billion business. And maybe 
that's sort of the kind of risk and that's kind of the bet that that Nike uh, has done in that space. Um, so yeah, I think uh, to sum it up, um, takeaways. First one is take your time. I think the the space is really still evolving. There's no one moment where we will enter a, a, a finally sort of evolved metaverse. It would be a slow process of getting there. Second one is get the culture, like try to experience some of the um, the applications yourself go in a discord chat etc like just embed yourself into what's really going on natively in that space then really important um draft a strategy like really think about if we want to enter that space how should that look like over the next three five ten years like don't just do a, a one-off thing don't just do a one-off stunt and then think about it small like launch a pilot uh, i don't know what it is maybe it's it's you you want to partner with roblox and offer something in that space maybe it's an nft um but think about it really as the first step in a in a bigger strategy um yeah that's basically my my uh 30000 feet view of the space um if you have any question please put them in the in the chat i'm happy to to answer those afterwards but uh yeah now i want to give it up to batuan and uh excited to hear what you think yeah thank you for your presentations and um, hello everyone as mentioned, I am Botwan, junior consultant at Digitopia, and I will be presenting about the metaverse, why it could work this time around. So sorry, but I want to start my presentation with a hype killer quote that you can currently see on the screen. We overestimate the short-term change. We find it hard to imagine long-term change. So let's dive in some real life examples to explain this code. Blockchain was buzzing because uh, the Bitcoin hype uh, in the previous months. Bitcoin was around 70K in valuation and some meme coins were hitting abnormal market caps. People were taking loans to immediately buy some dog tokens or ape NFTs. But currently is around 20K valuation. So it's not dead yet. It's still improving behind the curtains. Blockchain will have a deeper impact in our lives with lots of different use cases, but not necessarily right now. It will take time. Another example, Second Life in early 2000s was an example for earlier metaverse wave. Companies opened stores on there. An important example about that is sitting with us right now. We'll be presenting right after me, Halil. Halil was going to leave one of the industrial leader companies to join the Second Life team. Second Life team, yeah. He has more than 30 years of uh, consultancy experience and around 40 years of experience with computers. He saw the evolution, uh, evolution of both metaverse and computers. He spent those years, witnessed all those changes, yet what we are still talking about is digital transformation and metaverse transformation. And such changes take time, that proves basically, because after all these years, the topics are still the same. So nothing will be that fast paced. Nothing will be happening in a blink of an eye. Such changes take lots of time. Another story, this one may be a little bit different than what's written on the screen, but it's valuable anyways. Microsoft envisioned computers on every desk, whereas ex-CEO of IBM, Thomas Watson said, there is a world market for maybe five computers. So it is hard to imagine how will everything evolve in the long term and distinguish the hype from the reality in the short term. In the next slide, you are seeing the active number of users, so-called metaverse platforms. As you can see, these are the most mostly gaming platforms, including the top three, Roblox, Minecraft, and Fortnite. Millennials born into these platforms, and a lot of them are spending their time in there, like playing around, meeting, and competing with their friends, purchasing game skins, or wearing real-life clothes about these platforms or games. These skins are sometimes from companies that we know of, or the time spent is about the things that we know of from the real life. 
for example, Roblox has lands in collaboration with Nike and Spotify. And as Leo mentioned, Nike is investing in these areas with different approaches as well, such as NFTs. People can spend their time in Nike land. They have a partnership with Gucci as well. Another example is Mike, Minecraft. They launched a merchandise with Lacoste earlier, real life clothing mer merchandise. And they have just announced, I think two or three days ago, a partnership with Burberry. So does Fortnite. They hosted the live concerts of Travis Scott and Ariana Grande. People joined there with their avatars and spent some time in those concerts. But at the end of the day, the most active platform between these examples have only around 200 million active users. I am using the word only because it is nothing in comparison with the active user number of other platforms, such as social media platforms. So, yeah, thank you. Social media platforms have reached, as you can see, billions of users. They are accessible through both mobile devices and through our desktops. Even though we talk about the user numbers of metaverse platforms are not that high, it does not necessarily mean that people are not that ready. One of the most important signals that tells if it is the right time is how people act basically. Digital is part of our lives more than ever, especially after the pandemic. And these numbers you can see uh, are increasing every day. So does the screen times of us, the people. The most preferred social media has 3 billion people. The amount of data is progressive increasingly. So the data that recommendation engines collects currently are improving and improved recommendation engines basically do their job better. So that you can spend more time since the contents are more related to your interests. So people get more ready and adapt to digital even more. And the infrastructure is improving every day as well. This is what has changed since early 2000s. So people get ready, technology improves. But this should not create FOMO, fear of missing out. In the next slide, you do not necessarily have to be the first mover. This quote will be mentioned <laughs> right now, thank you. First mover does not always win. The rules of natural selection are unpredictable. There are, there are lots of real life examples for that as well. So the most buzzing one, buzzing one is Spotify. I do not know if you watch the Netflix show or not. By the way, Netflix is another example as well, but let's focus on Spotify. As mentioned in the TV show, there are recording companies, but as like then came pirates, websites that allow you to download music for free. Spotify was not the first one that made the music accessible through digital platforms, not the only one as well, but it controls the music industry currently. It has 32% market share, and it is more than two closest ri rivals combined, like Amazon and Apple Music. Another ex example may be music players. iPod was not the first music player, obviously, but thanks to the great design by the Apple team, Tony Fadel and those guys, it was a huge success. Another example, maybe they are not in the same category, but Fortnite, Minecraft, Roblox, or rather related platforms such as VRChat, Rec Room, all has more active users than the one of the first Metaverse platforms, Second Life. So after mentioning all these, why do we think that this time Metaverse will work out as stated on the title? There are two different aspects to evaluate changes to until 2002 to 2022. First of all, the most important one is people, as mentioned. We use social media daily, and there are billions of active users currently. We play online games, and those billions of people spend their time and money into these games. And unlike 2002, we are currently, we carry around smartphones in our pockets. Billions of computers are not only in our houses or not only on the desks as Microsoft envisions, envisioned, but they are even in our pockets now. 
So this makes everything more accessible and shows that people are actively using digital a lot more than before. The second aspect is what companies currently do. So first of all, cloud capacity and data collection has improved. It was very limited back then, but when sharing files was not that common, it was like that. Now companies provide around like 15 gigabytes per everyone for free. And it, bas it is basically mainstream now. The capacity has improved to a point that makes building some platforms available. GPU is in our life now. It, it provides better analysis, performance, and rendering capacity. So it provides an alternative for us to build uh, digital worlds, metaverses, that we will be spending our time on. Blockchain, NFT, DeFi, and all the new approaches of finance are here to support monetary infrastructure in metaverse as well, currently. AR, VR, MR, XR. These technologies have improved, although still not enough, and current platform look like games with low graphics, low quality. The improvements are obvious, and we are talking about the implementation of haptic technologies to those. So we are going ahead day by day. There are trillion dollar tech giants that are continuing to grow. And one of the most important business model is based on data nowadays. Metaverse allows data that the companies cannot collect with current platforms. New AR, VR glasses such as MetaGist released collect eye tracking data. They want to know where we look first, where do we visit in platforms that allow us to do our daily life activities. So data collection and growth model makes the biggest companies of today, as I mentioned. Google, Meta, Amazon, Apple, Tencent, Alibaba, Microsoft. They are the biggest companies and they are the biggest because of the data that they have. Spotify, Netflix, TikTok, maybe other examples for that. These are all big because of the detail of the recommendation engines that they have fed by data. So venture capitals are not surprisingly investing billions of dollars for the potential of big companies, future big companies in metaverse. The estimation, estimated potential markets is market value is around six to thirteen trillion dollars. So long story short, there are lots of different factors that changed since 2002. And this time has lots of reasons to be the right time. Yet there is no need to hurry. So you can be calm about that. You should have a strategy. And all the things that you need is mentioned in the previous uh, presentation by Leo. So I don't want to touch to those anymore. Thank you so much. I will be passing my words to Halil. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you, Patuan. Thank you, Leo. I think, um, Patuan, you forgot to mention that this basically is your lifespan uh, and, and a, a few years more. But um, I was actually already visiting the second live office uh, in 2005 in San Francisco. Um, and it was fantastic. So um, I was really very much enthusiastic about what Second Life will bring us. I spent a few hours every day almost in 2005, I think even in 2006, and then it quite quickly disappeared exactly because of these reasons, um, because we the, the, the rendering quality was not there yet. So it was very slow. The PCs um, were you know, still very, very slow. There was no iPhone back in 2005 and 2006. So as Leo stated, um, the world actually in our daily living, how we are now sitting in a study room or in our offices, the physical world actually for the last 50 years has not so much changed. But as many of you know, Moore's law um, started, um, the, the, that uh, paper was published, uh, that article uh, in 1965. And it basically told us and dominated not only the tech world with exponential growth, but all industries 
basically with exponential growth, exactly as Leo showed in this graph. So, and it, it created the first billionaires, and then it even created the first trillionaires um, today. And fortunately enough, Facebook is not among the, the trillion dollar companies these days. They probably will bounce back. Uh, we don't know, and and don't take this as any investment um, uh, suggestion. But um, I will not talk too much about the crypto suggestions as well, which I'm not an expert in. Um, and, and if I would be very smart about uh, suggesting anything, I probably would do all my personal financial investments in that area, which I'm not doing. So um, don't take these any of anything, basically, I'm saying as an investment uh, advice but rather as Leo and Batuan, my colleagues uh, before me, uh, told you that we definitely, and this you can take for sure, we definitely believe that the metaverse is here to stay, but it will take some time. And we already talked about why this is. And But you see on this page, and I think this we, we worked a lot on, on summarizing it down to these 10 arguments here, that there is an order of magnitude change happens during the last 10 years, even with the, the whole crypto world, and especially during the last 20 years. And the new generation, which was kind of, which is growing up in this age, they're basically consider the digital worlds very different from I'm age 50. Um, and and you know, I was older than Batuhan is today in the year 2002. Um, and and had a complete different way of living already, which is not changing too much, unfortunately. So, and and I don't want to make it too romantic and too too um, uh, nostalgic, but um, this is about people's behavior, and for many people, it is very difficult to understand why the young generation is spending so much time there. It's not just because they don't have anything better to do than that. It's really because it is engaging. There is also this ethical notion Leo has mentioned about the recommendation engine making it addictive and um, being making it manipulative about, you know, we're running into different different countries running different uh, elections these days and, and we have surprising um, outcomes sometimes. Um, and, and we saw this happening in many different countries in many different elections and referendums. Um, and it's going to continue to happen. And we uh, definitely have to work on that. But um, this is here to stay. So, and, and um, I'm a very optimistic person. So when I talk about technology, the fault of something good or bad happening is not because of that technology. The fault of something good or bad is happening is because of the people's intention. So we can do great things with artificial intelligence but we can do also big harm with artificial intelligence. This is not the fault of artificial intelligence. This is the fault or the, the, the moral compass of that individual person, company, or um, the metrics or the social uh, norms um, the person feels obliged or the person feels motivated by uh, to pursue his or her um, own vision uh, to achieve that social status or be compensated for whatever he or she is doing. So in that sense, all of us apply technology to our daily lives in our businesses. And each and every time you use technology, you should consider for what purpose you are doing this, what is the moral, your personal moral compass, and what is the company's moral compass and what you think is the right thing to do. And in that sense, it's not the harm of the technology. It's not the harm of the science. Yes, we have in, discovered the atom and yes, we've built the nuclear bomb and yes, we have thrown it on people, but we do great healing stuff with radiology and nuclear technology. We do great healing things with genetics and the metaverse can bring different people together. The metaverse can help us to augment the education services. The metaverse can help us in the emergency room to save lives. And the metaverse can do other many, many, many different great things. And that is the reason why we 
put these use cases into clusters, we believe. The metaverse will be a social platform and we will use it as a social platform. We are social animals. And the pandemic showed us that we sometimes can't even go out ruled by the regulator, by law enforcement. We were not allowed to leave our homes. So we needed other means and the telephone. That's the reason why the mobile phone is so popular. That's the reason why the smartphone is even more popular because it's not just a phone. We just don't talk to people. We see people. Um, we have our photos in there. It's a, it's a navigation device and everything. I will not talk about the millions of applications we are using it. And we find our spouses, we find our partners and everything else. And we will do this in a much more content richer, three-dimensional, much more immersive way. Why shouldn't we do that? Why shouldn't we do that if the technology is evolving and we will have better experiences in the metaverse? So that all looks like legless avatars at the moment. Like that's, the, that's the running joke of the metaverse. It's all legless avatars because the systems are not good enough yet. It, 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 it is because the servers have not enough capacity to render the legs. So they left out the legs because I can fly around anyway. And for flying, I don't need legs. By the way, for sitting here and talking to you, I don't need legs either. So uh, they just left it out. But as the technology will improve, and it does exponentially over the last 50 years, it did, and over the next 50 years, it will carry on doing it with quantum computing and other forms of computing. So we will have the capacity to make the metaverse look very similar to what we have in our real world in more affordable, faster in access and so forth. So we definitely will use it for gaming, for engagement, for dating, for events, for digital content, enriching our social experience as we, as we are now even more, many of us accept the Instagram and the Pinterest and the Snapchat interfaces already. And many people already be, are addicted to TikTok because the recommendation the engine works the best on the planet, basically. Another form, and, and remember the first days when you try to remember your first online purchase. And probably if you close enough uh, to my age, you might remember that it was quite cumbersome, uh, but nonetheless, we tried it out and we did it. And during the pandemic, again, many people, very young people and very old people relied on it to do it, to get their groceries back home. So because we were not allowed to go out again, and this might happen again, this might happen for different reasons. And they're disabled people and they're people in the rural areas who would like to experience something which is in the city, which they are not close to and so forth. So the metaverse in one way or the other and this will be all our design, our choices, the choices of the brands and the examples Batuan gave and the examples Leo gave are the very early examples. Those are could be compared to the first websites in 93 or 94 or 95. The metaverse has to be built. We have to envision the metaverse. We have to envision. And, and at the moment, when you go into the metaverse in Fortnite or Decentraland or any other place, why do we have a store at a sidewalk? The store could be in the clouds. The store could look completely differently. So imagine all those potential opportunities for architects, for designers. We don't have to build a store or a house or a university as it is in the physical existing world, because in the metaverse, there is no gravity. In the metaverse, there is no physical um, limitations. We could do basically anything. And this is exactly the third category for creators. Now you have truly unlimited opportunities. We are not bound to physics. In the metaverse, we are bound to server cloud capacity and GPU rendering capacity, basically. And just our imagination is probably the biggest um, in. Um, uh, um, differentiator and enabler or inhibitor of that creativity. But in the last category, we also could try to establish a metaverse which would mimic gravity, 
which would mimic physics because we might need it to run our digital twin of our factory, to run simulations of, of surgery, to run simulations of product testing, to probably even have a real size Halil avatar in the metaverse where I can try on some garment and see how it looks like. And this is a long time. This would combine the channel, the shopping with the digital version, which is the digital twin. And I could talk for hours, which I will not do because we are very curious about your questions, but the metaverse would give you all these opportunities and many more. These are just four clusters which are the main categories of the use cases for different industries and different business models. And now very briefly, what we came up, what we are good at is to help you to prepare. How ready are you? We think there are six things you have to think about and Leo and Batuan mentioned most of them already. You have to have an ambition. You should not do just that NFT drop. You should not just have one shop which is completely empty in Decentraland. You should have a long-term strategy. You should have an ambition. You should know why you do it. And then you should start building your capabilities and the culture. This is about ecosystems. This is about community. This is about sharing and engaging. This is about, you know, open up a marketplace somewhere in the physical world, imagine, like a, a, a grocery market where you have different people selling fresh food and vegetables and everything, whatever it is you're doing, you have to bring in the people, you have to make it engaging. And of course, all the technologies which were greatly structured in Leo's presentation, you have to, to follow what is evolving, what makes sense, what is feasible. There are, you know, the headsets are not widespread. We have 5 billion mobile phones out there. You can rely on people having mobile phones, smartphones with big screens and decent internet connection. People don't have headsets at home. I'm a geek. I don't have a headset. I try it out somewhere. I'm invited to different experiences, but I get motion sick. As long as they not fix the motion sickness problem, I will not buy a headset for me um, at home. So then there are these use cases, which I just talked about. So you have to decide what you want to do and why and how it will support your business or your NGO or your business model or your new innovation. And, and then all the ethics around it, all the re regulations around it, the law around the data privacy and, and, and protecting the people, thinking about the younger people in there you don't know who is coming in there um, and, and you don't know if it's a, a true person or a, or a bot or a troll or whatever. So you have to think about the governance notion of these as well. And we created some questionnaires and some workshop formats where we help you to understand on a scale from one to five, how complacent you are or are you eager to, to go into the metaverse and where, where you have some, some gaps and what you should do about it. And this is basically, you have to, as Leo and Patuan already stated as well, this is about experimentation. You have to get, get fluid with this. You have to get friendly with this. You have to understand what's going on there, what people are doing. Then, of course, we would, we would help you to do the self-assessments and to understand where you are, how ready you are, what you need to improve and, and how to do that. But at the end, you know, as it, we have these rules in there, there is, uh, the, you're not too late. You have not missed out anything. The time is, the timing is very important, and, but you have, should have a long-term strategy and, and um, which platform will prevail, nobody knows. So, um, there, so you have to do probably multiple experiments in different, um, in different platforms and see which is working the hardware selection, the platform selection, the use case selection. So you have to do different. Um, and I like the phrase how Leo put it as, as pilots trying out things where you have you know, limited effort and limited budgets, which you can um, accept to fail completely. So that's kind of spent for learning and experimentation. But then you might have some bets where you probably would not like to lose that money. So you should kind of balance your, your pilots and your bets and need to know 
how how this is running so we would kind of close up um and and i would like to invite back leo on stage because we've partnered with tlgg consulting um to to help you and we have a complementary the set of offerings basically we are more on the diagnostic side and on the preparation side of things and uh, leo's team at tlgg consulting they are more in helping you step into the metaverse in some form or the other leo you want to elaborate on that briefly you're on mute i guess I'm which sorry. is the most famous uh, sentence of the last three years <laughs> uh, exactly um yeah, sure. Briefly, and then then I want to have maybe give the, the audience a chance to, to respond. Sure. I think briefly, and feel free to reach out um, uh, anytime after this. Um, we basically on a spectrum. We we try to do the things between um, doing doing the right things and doing things right. Um, so basically, we start with strategy. We we want to sort of talk with you, understand your problems, etc., and figure out okay, what what's actually the opportunity for you in that space. Um, then. If we nail something down, maybe it's a product, we can be helpful for like setting it up, doing the concept validation, uh, helping with the product design, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and third one, if 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 you really plan to go sort of the venture building route, um, we actually do it right now uh, with a client uh, in, in Germany though, um, really setting up a venture in that space. Uh, and that can include everything sort of from finding the right people in the legal and tech space, uh, figuring the, the governance with sort of how should, that vehicle like work together with the overarching uh, corporate, etc. So yeah, that that's sort of the spectrum. Um, and yeah, happy happy to chat about uh, it in more detail. But um, Halil, maybe I, I give it up to the to the audience. If if some of you have like questions, um, I think you can raise your your arms and then we can uh, let you in on the panel. Otherwise, we we got some two questions I think before that we could touch upon. Um, yeah, so um, I, I I love the Mr. Zuckerberg question. So um, will Mr. Zuckerberg's metaverse vision and Meta's development be a real tipping point for the industry? If not, which company will be the mover for broader adoption of the metaverse? So um, Leo, what's your take on that? Uh, I mean, I, I like that you said earlier that this is no investment advice. So if if I knew the company that's going to be the next big thing, uh, then then I would probably be on the Bahamas and have my own island already and just like let the stock do the job. Um, I think with with Facebook and I actually uh, recommend a, a great podcast that I listened to over the weekend. It's maybe you you know the All In podcast. Um, they they talked about um, Meta recently and how investors sort of stopped believing in the stock. Uh, and they sort of argue that um, the bet is almost too big that they're currently doing. Like Facebook, usually usually if a corporate is sort of um, trying to build a new platform, it should be sort of, there should be some sort of consumer demand that is sort of fueling the investments. And with Meta right now, it feels a little bit like Mark Zuckerberg is sort of getting into this one corner and he's really doubling down on that idea. And it's almost like this all or nothing. So that's why I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm also a bit skeptical about Facebook because I don't want this one company owns it, uh, owns the data and uh, essentially creates this closed garden and you have, I don't know, app store like um, fee structures for any startup that wants to build within that ecosystem. So both from, an, from a business perspective, business analyst perspective potentially and like the, the ethical perspective, I'm, I'm skeptical about... Um, about about uh, uh, Meta, which other company? I think um, I think there's no one. I I don't believe the metaverse is one company. That's why I think there's a multitude of companies that are interesting. Um, you could look at like gaming companies. They probably create something in that space. Um, of course, big tech has their role. Um, sort of second order effect is a company like Nvidia that's that's providing a lot of sort of the the graphic chips etc. Et is interesting. So. Probably, if you wanted to, you could build a metaverse ETF, but I'm not sure which companies would be in there. But it's it's a whole index of companies that's potentially interesting in that space. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, and um, many experts compare this uh, to the establishment of the internet, basically. And you have uh, the infrastructure companies, you have um, the websites, you have the different applications. The, the mobile phone entered uh, the space. <coughs> so you have the 
the device makers, you have the telecom operators, and I think the metaverse will be the next layer, basically, as we have 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, the metaverse is the next iteration of a broad digital realm, basically, which is based on top of the internet, which is but uh, much more immersive. Um, so we have um, two other questions coming from the audience here about centralized and decentralized metaverses which one has the most growing potential? Um, Leo, go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, um, probably like from a, from a pure architecture point of view, I would say since, since decentralized ecosystems are still sort of, despite their growth, are still comparatively smaller, there is more growth potential there, right? Because it's just right now we, we, we I, like we have a smaller, still relatively smaller crypto space as opposed to all the centralized architecture um, that's out there. Um, I think um, it's use case driven potentially as well. I think there, there it's not necessarily sort of the one metaverse, um, but it's maybe like some things will be in the decentralized world. Uh, I, I certainly believe crypto has some use cases. At the same time, I don't necessarily think that every e-game needs to be like a, a decentralized game. So um I know I don't give any definitive answers today, so I'm sorry for that, but I would say... <laughs> you're a consultant. Um, in some, some fashion or another. You're a consultant. You're well-trained. The first thing a consultant learns is uh, the answer of it depends, right? Uh, uh, no, so... that, I, that I learned in my econ studies already. That I learned much <laughs> earlier, that brainwashing. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, um, one of my favorite uh, terms is ambiguity. So I think the metaverse will be very ambiguous as well, and which will be a good thing. So, and, and the better ones will prevail. We see this in nature. This is natural selection, basically. And we see this in good, rather less regulated economies as well. And the some sort, um, and we, we, this is not uh, a, a economy class. So we'll not talk about, uh, you know, capitalism or socialism or any other uh, liberalism or neoliberalism, but we see that some market dynamics are very working very healthily and, and thriving, thriving innovation, which is competition and, and uh, these kind of things. So there's another great question from, uh, from Rob. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so there's a lot of ambition from individuals, of course, um, who are excited about the metaverse. But what do you think about the enthusiasm and the will for investment in this area from corporate decision makers? Uh, you just said you're working with a German company and, and Germany is not the most innovative and the most digital advanced um, society, let's say. Economically, yeah. uh, they're doing great, but the society is rather... You know, that there's still, I think, a very high percentage of not smartphone users. Um, and there's still people without any mobile phone. I'm German background, so I know very well what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, what, uh, and, and you gave examples, Batuan gave examples from real companies you're working with, we're working with. Yeah. So there are, there is some interest, right? It, I would say definitely. I mean, there's definitely interest. The, um the the in the end like the way we think about every pitch that we make every every conversation that we have is like in in the end like what's the equity story like what 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 does it lead up to if if you just sort of say okay look at this board ape they they are like worth 200k now that's some that, that, that that's nice on an individual level but like if you're like a corporate of a multi-billion dollar company first you think a lot about risk and brand risk and at the same time Money-wise, that's also a drop in the ocean. So in the end, like if you also think about it as of like a revenue model, like just just tell a different story of why this is relevant, as opposed to looking at only the the sort of collection of screenshots of flashy headlines and sort of clickbait, fishy NFT, Bitcoin, whatever is great kind of um, presentation. So, but but really focusing more on sort of second layer. Okay, what's what's the underlying technology? And I think then. A corporate leader is also more um sort of more receptive um but usually it takes a while until we get to talk about the topic with the ceo still so that still takes a while um so it's it's not that for most i think for most brands and most companies most industries it's not that yet top of mind so you you have to walk your way up there but ideally ideally you should always talk to the ceo yeah. in the end it's where business Great. strategy yeah thank you i basically agree with what you said so far 
and my observations are enthusiasm is quite there still even after these huge drops in prices it's of course decreased but a little bit enthusiasm still left and companies are seeking what to do in the metaverse still but what they are planning to do currently is what you said in your presentations that they shouldn't be doing what they shouldn't be doing leo mentioned those parts random nft drops or random metaverse stores are what they think of first and strategy is what they like and it is mostly hype and enthusiasm based what we have seen so far i think so the problem is due to that not the enthusiasm but there is still even though it's little there's still some excitement yeah Thank you, Batuan. Yeah, I've, I've spent 12 years at Gartner and uh, one of the best inventions uh, from the proprietary models Gartner has is the hype cycle, probably many of you know. And um, as uh, Mark Zuckerberg did his announcement in October, exactly about, about you know, 12, 13 months uh, ago, it went up very crazily. Uh, immediately, Meta were, was the headline all over the place. Um, and exactly in January, when the Federal Reserve um, raised the interest rates and declared uh, almost recession or stagflation, they called it, and we had um, you know, double digit inflation ratio, as fast as it skyrocketed, as fast the whole crypto world, the Web3 and the whole metaverse hype went down uh, what Gartner calls the trough of disillusionment. So the metaverse is the next big thing probably but it will take some time to build it so it it is not it's not there um, there are just legless avatars and just very few of them in very few uh and in in very few uh, virtual environments and there are only very few people having a metamask account uh, and and buying and selling stuff there so um, there are a few billionaires like the Gemini uh, twins and like, you know, uh, Sam Bankman Fried and, and, uh, and Vitalik Buterin and so forth. But uh, it's just a few. Um, it's, it's not just, it's a fraction of Wall Street, basically, what it is. Um, and and we'll, we'll see it. So that hype has slowed down and cold, you know, is, is almost, I would not say frozen, but it's very cold now. It's very, very inactive. But the technology is evolving. Facebook is spending billions. Nvidia is spending billions. You know, many other companies. Where everybody waits uh, to see the Apple glasses. So when, uh, uh, which will look very similar to the glasses Leo has um, uh, on. So, um, and we will not know how well. You know, the 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 airport business is a twenty-five billion dollar business. So Apple is able to sell us these earbuds for quite an amount of money and to sell it to hundreds of millions of people and able to ship and able to establish the supply chain for this. So once we have an affordable glass, which will enable us to see the real world and some layer on top of it, and if Apple is selling this in their temple-like stores, then it could change something as the iPhone changed something. And this must not be Apple this time around. It could be another player. Again, this is no investment advice, uh, but um, there will be different things out there. I don't think we will have these big headsets on uh, our heads. Um, I'm definitely will not, um, but um, uh, I'm definitely very much interested in new immersive experiences and in new interesting business models speaking about business yeah. models we have another very interesting uh, completely different kind of question approach how global or how local the metaverse can be and what kind of opportunities are there for retailers because if it's just a global phenomenon then probably the big brands will dominate it again but if this could you know be probably connected to physical proximity to my neighborhood and um, then probably it will be very interesting for local retailers or even you know solo entrepreneurs and other forms and with the whole notion of organic local and 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 regional and you know more socially um, ethical um, uh, positive impact probably even sustainable this could have a, a, a new form of adoption if this is provided so leo what do you think about 
the, this, this notion of proximity and locally and globally uh, notions of the metaverse. I, I do have plenty of thoughts on this, but I'm just wondering with respect to time, because we already like 10, 10 minutes over. That's um, true. If, if whoever wants to hear the answer can reach to out, out to us again. Um, I'm just wondering if it's if it's maybe um, better to to wrap up. And I would love to. I would love to. They have so many more questions and thoughts, and uh, wonder if we we can take this like to like individual conversations um, and and talk about these things. What do you think? That's a good point. Yes, uh, fair enough. Yeah. For many people, it uh, um, time and and time. We should be respectful of everybody's time. Thank you for that reminder. I'm getting too much excited <laughs> about things sometimes but with it already overrun. So um, thank you for the organizers, the heroes in the background. Uh, thank you for all the attendees um, and thank you TLGG consulting team uh, for this wonderful collaboration and this wonderful content. Thank and you, that was fun. Related, um, we, um, you have our contact details, basically reach out to TLGG consulting, Leo, Mats and, and their team. Um, Digitopia, um, Batuan, myself, you can find us on digitopia.co and on LinkedIn and uh, on other means. And uh, we definitely would love um, to to continue this conversation with you people. Yeah. Leo, exactly. Batuan, last words to you guys. Thank you very much. Okay, Leo, you go first if you want. No, nothing to add. I think well, well said. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm always always in to talk more about this space and then hopefully like moving from talking to doing. Um, definitely yeah cool so i also right. agree with what's said so far and i i cannot currently see about the meta question who asked that but i don't i want to reply to that in private if you have additional time and if you wonder a little bit more because that was also what one of my area of interest as well as the whole conversation but that one specifically so we can continue from chat if you'd like to talk anymore all of you, any questions that you have, so you can reach out. Thank you for listening, everyone. All right, ladies and gentlemen, see you in another Thank webinar everyone. or in in real life or in the metaverse. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.